Tim and the worship team always know how to wake us up, don't they, man? It is awesome. You guys are in for a treat today during worship time. I just want to say welcome. Thank you for being at New Hope today. If you are a guest, this is your first time here, thank you so very much for coming. You honor us by your choice this morning. Uh, I'm going to let Chris on the video announcement tell you about filling out a card and all that kind of stuff here in just a minute. But how do you like the scene as the backdrop for church life today? Huh? That was just painted yesterday at the women's painting event that was here at the church. A couple of samples are, uh, were left. Those are from two of the women, uh, Helen Heath and, uh, and Tammy. And so uh, their pictures are over there so you can kind of see what they did. So ladies, maybe if you were sort of afraid to come, all right, uh, next time you'll see it's not so frightening, you might end up with a masterpiece, all right? And Milo took a picture of one of them today and put it right up there on the screen for us. So I think the ladies did just a great job. Now, the art instructor told everybody at the class yesterday, art is most appreciated from six feet and further back, okay? So don't get any closer than six feet to fully appreciate the artwork which is done over there. Uh, may I direct your attention to the screen and our morning announcements, if you would, please. Welcome to New Hope Community Church. We're so glad that you've chosen to worship with us today. Here at New Hope, we have a passion to compellingly communicate the all absolute sufficiency of Jesus Christ who meets our every need. If you're a guest with us today, we would love to get you some information about the ministries and what New Hope has to offer. So if you could fill out those connect cards right in front of you, fill that out, drop it right in the offering plate, and we would love to uh, send you something in the mail. We're not gonna call you. We're not gonna come knock at your door. We're gonna send you something in the mail so you can hear more about what New Hope is about and the ministries we have to offer. One of those ministry opportunities is here at New Hope on Wednesday night. Man, our Wednesday nights are full of energy and excitement. We have our jam kids for kids uh, first grade through sixth grade. We have our junior high program that meets. Our adults are in a Bible study called The Good Book, going over main stories of the Bible. It's, it's good stuff. We have our choir rehearsal happening. We have grief share happening. And if you're like, hey, I need some food, we also have dinner happening. Family dinner start at 6.15. If you wanna come and eat, get to know some different people here at New Hope. And then at seven o'clock, we'll all split into our different areas and uh, go learn about Jesus together. Oh, man. It's cold out there. Is anybody else cold? Oh. So here we are at Calvin Crest. What's the weather going to be like this year? Who snows? Nobody snows, really. We won't know until we see the weather report. Anyway, you don't want to miss this. Snow, go online right now and register at calvincrest.com for our women's retreat at the end of April. See you there. Hey, New Hope, it is pie auction time. Man, I'm so excited. This time every year, I get the privilege and the opportunity to take a group of students down to Mexico. We've been going to Rosarito, Mexico to work on an orphanage down there to spread the good news of Jesus, to compellingly communicate the all-sufficiency of Jesus down in Rosarito, Mexico. Part of what helps us get down there is our annual pie auction. This is a great time where our very own senior pastor, Tim Rowland, serves as auctioneer as he auctions off the desserts you make so you can buy them. It's a great system. I love it every year. Hey, so this year, if you want to make something for a pie auction, I would absolutely love it. If you want to bring something, you're a painter and you want to give away a free room, we would love that as well. In your bulletins today, there was an insert. You can write down those items and that helps kind of the registering of your items that helps us do it a little bit quicker. So it's pie auction time coming up on March 11th, Sunday night, 6 p.m. We would love to have your pies there by 5.30. I can't wait. I'll see you there. Hey, New Hope. This is Eric Olson. I serve as the ministry leader for Celebrate Recovery here at New Hope. This Thursday, we're going to celebrate nine years of having Celebrate Recovery here at New Hope. We'd love to have you come join us. We're going to have an awesome time. We're going to have a barbecue dinner starting at 5.30. We're going to begin worship with some mini testimonies, a little program. Uh, we, we hope to be done by no later than 8.30, and then we're going to have birthday cake. So please come join us, help us celebrate. Uh, you will be blessed, I'm sure. 
On March 17th, we have an all church work day scheduled. There's all sorts of jobs that need to happen around here at New Hope, uh, from vacuuming to window cleaning to the list goes on and on. And so March 17th, uh, Small Groups is sponsoring an all church work day. Um, eight o'clock, meet at the church at eight o'clock. Coffee's on at 7.30 because we always need coffee to work well. Uh, and I have a feeling there might be some delicious breakfast. I'm just saying. And so come at eight o'clock, we're gonna start our work day probably till about one-ish, eight to one, all church work day, March 17th. Can't wait to see you there. Men, don't forget this Saturday, 8 a.m., there is men's breakfast. There'll be a delicious breakfast. Coffee will be ready at 7.30. Uh, we're gonna try and do it every month this year, except February, but uh, we're gonna try and fit it in every other month for the year. Uh, so don't forget, second Saturday of every month will be men's breakfast. Hey, prime timers. That's right, I'm talking to you guys and gals who have the privilege of being 55 years or older. We have a place for you. Tuesday, March 13th, we have our prime timer luncheon. We would love for you to come and show up. Bring some food if you're a regular. We gotta fill that dessert table up, guys. Come on, it's gonna be delicious. If you're not a regular and you wanna just come check us out, come check us out. I'll give you a hint. Uh, let's call it a good tip. The tip is hit the dessert table first. It's gonna be awesome. There's all sorts of things. So if you can make something, if you can bring something, we'd love to see you on March 13th. Thank you so much for joining us today. If you have any prayer requests or prayer concerns, or just wanna let us know how you're doing, feel free to fill out one of those connect cards and put the prayer request on there. Us as a staff would love to pray for you this week and have the church be praying for you this week. We hope that today be a day that you see Jesus clearly, that you hear from him, that you trust in the all absolute sufficiency of Jesus Christ who meets our every need. All right, thank Chris and the rest of the team for putting that together. I just wanna highlight a couple of things because I'll up see the picture of all the ladies yesterday. That was absolutely awesome. Uh, celebrate Recovery, uh, the event on Thursday night. Uh, wow, next year will be 10 years and we'll really make sure we have a huge event for that. Uh, but their anniversary celebration is always terrific to hear the testimony. So if you can't make it for the barbecue and the dinner, come, come at 6.30 and hear some of the testimonies of how lives have been changed. And then the pie auction, that is next Sunday night. Kepler, are you still back there? Back here. All right. Here's, we're gonna have something brand new this year. Uh, Kep is with us next Sunday again, and then he's gonna be gone for uh, about a month or so, a little at three weeks, uh, to Hawaii. Okay. Suntan. Working on his suntan. <laughs> uh, and so we're not gonna see him until after Easter. But he bragged to somebody that he makes the best sweet potato pie. So he is bringing a homemade sweet potato pie for us to auction off next at two. Oh, did I hear that? That came from your wife. Oh, oh, okay. Anyway, there'll be one, maybe two he's going to bring. First time ever to auction off a homemade sweet potato pie here. All right? So we'll add that to the list. All right, wonderful. So I really do want it because it's, it's come on us quick this year. Get that best dish you've got, whether it's a dessert or a casserole or a homemade dish. Uh, bring it fresh that evening. Uh, if you're going to be bringing a donation, would like a little extra help this year to help expedite things on Sunday night. In the bulletin, there's an insert. I would love, we want you to fill this out before uh, next Sunday night. Bring it with the items you're gonna bring. Name, address, city, zip there, and then your items listed. Don't fill out the ticket number. The staff here at the church, the kids who are taking your desserts or your dishes in that night, they'll assign it a number, all right? And this just makes pain at the end and saying thanks at the end much easier for us. But so dad often brings banana pudding. So if dad's got two banana puddings under item one, banana pudding, item two, banana pudding. Does that make sense? So if you'll have that portion filled out and you give it to uh, the team when you turn your dishes in Sunday night uh, before the auction, this will expedite things very, very much. We'll have more of these in the bulletin next Sunday as well. So we look forward to seeing you, whether you can stay for the whole thing or just come for part of it, we look forward to having you here, all right? Uh, please take note of the other things that are in the bulletin and uh, put them to good use as they apply to you. Uh, let me now share with you, and it's a pretty lengthy list of prayer requests today. 
Uh, this past week has been uh, very busy in dealing with families and the loss of loved ones, and it will be again next week. Uh, this past week, and so please be remembering the Noble family, longtime Clovis family. Uh, Bill Noble was born at the house which is now gone, that for many, many years was at the corner of Temperance and Knees. I drove by it thousands of times when I lived out in the country because it was my way to and from. I waved at Bill Noble for years, all right, uh, but never stopped and met him. Uh, he was born in the house next door and lived in the house next to it the rest of his life. He never got off of that corner, all right, in terms of living. Um, he has a son and a daughter who still reside here in the Clovis area, so please be praying for them. Yesterday, we also had the service for Rick Morlock, died at 59 years of age. Uh, his son and my son were very, very good friends. Ronnie Sandoval is a service that we have this afternoon, 52 years old, again, cancer. Um, from our own church, Janet Soderstrom Riska. Uh, her husband Tom went with us to Africa this year. Janet worked with me at the Bible House. Uh, her father passed away this past week. And she also just found out that her mom, who had knee replacement surgery a few months ago, has got such a severe infection in the knee, they're going to have to remove the artificial knee get everything cleaned up, and then give her another knee uh, in the future. So pretty serious times going on for them right now. Good friends of uh, John and Allie Longstaff, uh, who's been to church some. Her name was Bobby Farina. She passed away, and that service is going to be this coming Wednesday. Bill Burmeister. Bill and his wife have been part of our church family for several years uh, until they, he was not able to come anymore for about the last 18 months. Bill passed away this past week, and his service is going to be this coming Friday at 1 o'clock here at New Hope. Some of you will probably get another email from us here in the office. We'll need some help with, uh, uh, with some serving as well as some food. Thank you so much for your help this past week. You all always rise to the occasion, and we are so grateful. Uh, and then Joyce Martins, a longtime uh, New Hope member, her and her husband, uh, Richard, they used to sit right over there by where the bread window is, all right? That was their seat right on the end of it. You're in their seat right now, all right? <laughs> uh, but they were regular every Sunday until they became homebound because of health issues. Richard passed away last year, and while I was in Africa, Joyce passed away. Just got the message this past week from their son, and um, I'll be meeting with him Tuesday to prepare for Thursday service. And that service will be at Chapel the Light at 10 o'clock in the morning. So some of you longtime New Hope members will remember them, and uh, they would love to have you come be a part of that service. Uh, some updates on some other folks connected to our church family. My son Chad had shoulder surgery on Friday. He's home. He's got 10 uh, staples in his shoulder, probably a th about a three-month rehab process. Milt Pierce that we told you uh, was having surgery on Tuesday to remove a tumor. He had been through radiation and chemo work uh, that reduced the size of the tumor. Their intent was to go in, <coughs> excuse me, uh, remove uh, what was left of the tumor, and they were able to do that. However, that tumor was resting on the main artery that goes into the right lung. And so they went ahead and took the right lung while they were in there at it. Uh, you can live with just one lung, all right? One lung, you know, he will not be able to run a marathon any longer, all right? Probably hadn't run one in a while anyway, my guess. But uh, he is home from the hospital. He is doing very, very well. And so we are grateful for that. Angie Monroy, in this service last Sunday, uh, sitting right back there. In, uh, Angela Wave. Okay. Uh, Angela is Angie's daughter, all right? And their sister, Giovanna, was here. They had mom here. As you know, she had a stroke um, not quite two years ago. It was pretty serious. She now is cared for at the California Armenian home, but the girls always bring her every Sunday to church. And she was here last Sunday, but she didn't want to leave. Uh, she had had a little mini stroke on the pew and had become pretty non-responsive. Her, her heart rate had dropped to about 30. And so uh, we had a fireman sitting right near her, and so he took care of her until the paramedics arrived. And uh, she was in the hospital for uh, the first half of the week, was able to go home, I believe, on Thursday back to the Armenian home, and she has responded very well since then. So she's improving. Heart rate's still a little slower than you'd like, but uh, she's sitting up in her wheelchair at her home, and she's able to, to do some more things than she was. So we're grateful for the improvement. Uh, John Miller is still at Clovis Community Hospital. He did finish his 10 days of, of, of very intense chemo and radiation, had a few days to recover with some platelets 
bracelets and uh, uh, blood transfusions. Then they did a bone marrow test again. The goal was to get the, the numbers, the blast numbers for leukemia under five and as close to zero as they could. They had been up to uh, what basically is called 30. Um, the good news is it was reduced to 10. The bad news is it was reduced to 10. Um, if they can't get it below five, you cannot do a bone marrow transplant. And so uh, they did start yesterday another low dosage. He cannot, his body would not handle another round of treatment like he went through the first of the month. So they're going to do something much, much less, see if they can reduce it some more. Um, then they'll take the next step. And next steps we're well aware of may be there's nothing more we can do. So please be praying for John and his family as they process through all of this at this particular moment. Um, Trish Sanchez, who I shared with you last Sunday, had had a massive stroke, had been non-responsive for uh, almost two weeks now. The good news is uh, she is out of ICU. They have, she's no longer intubated. Uh, speech is beginning to come back and memories are coming back. So there is some improvement after two weeks of being non-responsive. Uh, Aunt Helena, who normally is sitting up here in this service next to Gil, uh, is sick today. And so Gil sent me a text earlier this morning letting us know that they would not be here. Please be praying for her. Um, and then Daniel is a young man in his late 20s. His last name is Wilson. Uh, his mother and grandfather attend church regularly here. He's had a series of health issues. And um, this coming Tuesday, he's going to have an angiogram, and usually those are not all that serious. However, in his case, it is because his kidneys are not very good. Doing an angiogram, you have that dye in your system, and that is very hard on the kidneys. So this angiogram must be done. At the same time, they have to watch how his kidneys are doing. So they have requested prayer uh, for him as well. So those are uh, a very long list of updates today of how things are going. One last one. Uh, Rich Smith, our associate pastor of counseling here, uh, he had a really difficult small group evening this past week. During his small group, he had a TIA, which is kind of a mini stroke. Uh, he became non-responsive during small group. They called for an ambulance. Ambulance took him to St. Agnes Hospital. St. Agnes Hospital ran a series of tests, including an MRI, and discovered he had a brain clot in the brain. Uh, they were surprised he had not had a a massive stroke. Um, apparently, the Central Valley of California does not have a doctor who does the procedure where you go in through a major artery into the brain and break up the clot. So they wanted to airlift him to the Bay Area. There is a facility in San Jose that that's a specialty of theirs, but the weather was so bad Thursday night, they could not airlift him. So they put him in an ambulance and sent him by ambulance to San Jose. Um, <clears throat> have no idea what transpired from Fresno to San Jose, but it was good. When he got there and then they ran their own set of tests, the blood clot was gone. You can put any answer that you want to. I'm going to simply say thank you, Lord, all right, for that process. Uh, they did keep him until yesterday uh, for observation, ran another set of tests to make sure uh, there wasn't something that had been missed, and um, they did not release him until late in the day yesterday, and so uh, Regina let me know last night that they would be back today, but they were spending the night up there, which was a good choice with the weather the way it was, and they will be coming back home. So uh, looked pretty bleak for us late Thursday night with Rich, and and uh, by the following day, things looked really, really good. So I know they would appreciate your prayers of gratitude for what's transpired. I'm going to ask our ushers to come forward and wait on us as we have our morning tithes and offering. Would you join with me as we pray? Our Father, we had a, a rather long laundry list today. And I know you were listening as we mentioned every one of them. And Father, you know about each of them far more in depth than I even do and thank you for your care for us and your concern thank you that you give us this privilege of sharing our needs and laying them at your feet and saying God we want your best um, and your best is sometimes far different than what we think the best would be and so we trust you and we commit each of them to you and however you can use us to be of help or encouragement or hope to others uh, I hope you'll find us willing ready and available Lord, as we go through a list like that, I, I was reminded in the 8 o'clock service of your words, um, the words of Jesus, your son, 
just days before his betrayal, just days before his crucifixion, just days before his death, Jesus said these words to his followers, do not let your hearts be troubled. As Jesus faced great trouble, he tells us, don't let your hearts be troubled. He said, in this world, you will have much trouble, but I have overcome the world. Just as I'm going to face betrayal and crucifixion and death, and I will be victorious over all that, I will be victorious in you through whatever troubles you may face, so don't let your hearts be troubled. Father, may we learn to live in the reality of your promise because we have learned to live in your presence moment by moment and day by day. Thank you, Father, for the privilege of giving today, sharing back with you our offerings and our gifts because we live a life of faith and dependence upon you. Thank you for the way in which you meet our needs. And thank you for the privilege of investing your resources literally around the world. We trust you for this and so much more in the name of Christ. Amen and amen. <coughs> <laughs> That is so good. That is just so good. Um, you know, uh, last Friday was Billy Graham's memorial service. I suspect that Cliff Barrows had gotten a choir together in heaven and had that rendition version for Billy Graham. Because if you remember, Cliff Barrows' choir almost always sang at the Crusades, How Great Thou Art. And probably George Beverly Shea, who died at 102, all right, I bet he sang I'd Rather Have Jesus. All right, that was just a staple at all the crusades. Uh, I hope many of you had the opportunity to watch his memorial service. Uh, if you didn't, I know it's online, and you can go there. That is on my agenda this coming week. And, um, uh, boy, just what a wonderful impact that Billy had on the world. Uh, just a side note, uh, Billy's son Franklin is going to be in Fresno on Memorial Day, Monday, Okay, the Monday evening, there's going to be a citywide Clovis and Fresno uh, event at the fairgrounds. Uh, there are some people who are worried that it's at the fairgrounds. Do not be worried that it is at the fairgrounds. All right. Uh, first off, this is a citywide event. Remember Samaritan's Purse, which is, uh, you know, what Frank... He, that they go to areas, all right, that are in need. And uh, I think it's great for us. I'm going to be going. I hope uh, we'll, you'll hear more about it in the weeks to come. Uh, but I hope that on that Monday, we've got at least 100 folks from New Hope who make the journey uh, to the fairgrounds, be there for that. I can't wait to see what Franklin might have to say, knowing that his father's just in heaven for a couple of months. Um, but it's a chance to reach a greater community with the message of Jesus Christ. So that's just a little advertisement. Um, another advertisement. Do you know what one month from today is? It is Easter Sunday. One month from today is the first Sunday of April is Easter Sunday. If you all haven't looked at the calendar and figured out that the first Sunday of April is April 1st this year. Okay? I suggest to you the original April Fool's Day was Easter Sunday morning when folks showed up to take care of the body of Jesus only to hear, April Fools, he is not here, he is risen, and he is risen indeed. Um, and so you're going to hear a little bit of that on April Fool's Day this year, all right? Uh, and our, our, our Easter choir is just going to be magnificent. We also have a treat for you, and that is Palm Sunday, our children's choir. They have already been working a month during this service over in our Sunday school area. Uh, our kids have been working on uh, a Palm Sunday musical, and they will be sharing that with us on Palm Sunday morning. It will be just absolutely uh, terrific. Um, I love the line of one of the songs that we worship with today, and it's so appropriate for today's message, and that is, nothing else matters. It all revolves around Jesus. I hope that's true for your life. If you're going to be an open-door Christian, that needs to be true. All that matters is him. I invite you, if you'd like to, to turn to Genesis chapter 11, and put a finger there, or if your Bible's like mine, you can just pull it out, that first part, and you can set it right above, and you're going to be in good shape. Um, Hebrews uh, chapter 11 and Genesis chapter 11, we'll be reading from both of those passages in just a few moments. 
Uh, back in the middle of January when we started this series uh, on the subject of Open Doors, a church-wide Bible study for our small groups, and uh, the beginning of a Sunday morning series, and it's also being used on Sunday nights. Um, the Bible study ended for most of our small groups this past week who were doing it, and it will end tonight in the Sunday evening service. Mark will be preaching a final message on understanding closed doors, all right? And uh, the Sunday morning, we're going to stay on this subject all the way through Easter because I think the greatest open door in the history of the world took place on Easter Sunday morning. So we're just going to kind of stay right in this theme until we get to Easter. Uh, but tonight, you want to come back uh, over in the bridge building, and Mark will be preaching about understanding closed doors. Uh, Sunday night is available to you at any time. Uh, I'll have to say probably from a staff. Uh, the response from the church has been kind of lukewarm about Sunday nights, all right? Some nights it's been, we've had as many as 100 and some. Uh, more often than not, it runs between the 25 and 45. Uh, but it fills, I think, a very important need in our church. I would love for some of you to, to, to check it out, take a little more advantage of it. You'll get a chance to meet other people from other services you wouldn't meet otherwise. Uh, it's much uh, more informal, which uh, uh, lends for a few things to take place that doesn't happen on a Sunday morning. It also gives other members of our staff the opportunity to preach more often uh, and uh, work on those skills and those gifts that God has given them. It gives a chance for some of our young adults to be engaged more in our music. They, they, they lead our worship on Sunday nights. Um, and one of the other major reasons we chose to do that is there are people who cannot come to church on Sunday mornings. They work. That's their schedule. And uh, we just had another new prayer. This has happened probably, I'm going to say a third of the time on Sunday nights as somebody shows up at New Hope for the first time because they went online and found out, oh, you have a Sunday night church. I can go to that one. And that's how they've been introduced to New Hope and, in some cases, even to Jesus Christ. So that will be tonight at 6 o'clock, and uh, Mark will love seeing you here this evening. Back when we started the series, the first message that I preached was looking at seven characteristics of open-door people. These were characteristics identified by uh, the pastor and the author of the study that our small groups were engaged in. And uh, I sort of outlined those seven characteristics and only had time to talk about three of them. And so today what I'm going to do is outline those seven characteristics again, and I'm going to talk about a couple of more of them. Uh, in the 8 o'clock service, I talked about the rest of the four. In the last service, I only talked about two out of the remaining four. So we'll just figure out where we end up in this service today, all right? I had to tell them in the last service, today's message is kind of like a stick of salami. You just cut it off when you get full, okay? And so that's kind of what we're going to have to do, I think, today. All right, but here are, if you take notes, here are the uh, seven characteristics of open door people. Um, you may remember them, but if not, here they are again. Number one, and we already looked at it in depth, is open door people are ready, ready or not. Open door people recognize that it's not about their preparedness, it is about Christ's ability. And so open door people are people who are ready for an open door at an instant moment because they know that they're dependent upon God, not upon their own preparedness. Open door people, number two, open door people are unhindered by adversity. Sometimes people will say when there is adversity, that must mean it's a closed door. God never said that. Walking through an open door doesn't mean there isn't adversity and obstacles on the other side of the door. The door is open. There may be challenges when you get on the other side of the door. Open door people don't perceive adversity as obstacles, and obstacles are not understood as don't go, closed door. The third characteristic of open door people is they are blessed to bless. An open door person knows that the presence of Christ in them has brought them many blessings, and they want God to be able to express his blessing through them to others. Let me give you a very practical example of what I'm talking about here. This past week, an email went out to much of the church, letting you know that there was going to be a memorial service here yesterday. And on that 
there were uh, people who responded, yes, I can show up and I can set up for the memorial service. There were other people who checked off, yes, I can show up to clean up after the memorial service and get the church ready for Sunday morning. There were others who responded and said, yes, I can come and serve during the serving time of the reception after the service is over. And there were others of you who said, I can bring a salad. Uh, you know what? Uh, I, can, I can make a dessert. Okay? For some of you, that's a piece of cake. I came up with that one all by myself last service. I was very proud. Of that. That, was, that was a good one. Uh, yeah, but, but, but the fact is, you, you said, hey, here is an open door. And I want you to understand, open doors aren't always about going to Colombia or Africa. Open doors are about being available for opportunities. Some opportunities are small. Some opportunities are big. But you all responded. And as happens on many occasions, the son of the dad who passed away at the end of the event yesterday, the service was over, everything was cleaned up, put away. He was still hanging out, visiting with folks in the parking lot. And he said to Shelley, you tell Tim and the church, thank you. They made a hard day better for my family. That's an open door. But I learned something more yesterday. I don't often eat at the receptions. They're, 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 one, there's a lot of them, and num number two, I don't know who cooked it. So, <coughs> um, yesterday, what it was is, you know, uh, when they told me what they were going to bring, they were going to, his, his favorite food was Mexican food. His favorite restaurants were Mexican restaurants. So they were going to contact either Sal's or Los Pepe's and Sanger, and they were going to get uh, trays, all right? So taquitos and small burritos and those kind of quesadillas. And, there gonna be, and so then we said, okay, well, well, we'll supplement that with salads and desserts from our church, all right? So there'll be plenty of food for everybody. They made a little change of plans and didn't tell us. They had a, um, a, a Mexican couple from Sanger who has a catering business called Garcia's Catering come and serve. Well, they didn't bring hors d'oeuvre trays. They brought their kitchen. They, I mean, they brought the, they, I mean, they, they got the, the, the heat, the fire, all right? Uh, they had the pots. They had the, the beans in there, and they had the carnitas, and they had uh, the, the, the shredded beef, and they had rice, and, and they had carne asada. I walked in that room and it smelled like heaven and they had homemade salsa. I, I, I was almost ready to believe what Gil Hernandez has told me for three decades, that they speak Spanish in heaven, okay? <laughs> that that's the heavenly language because it smelled like heaven yesterday in there. They had homemade salsa, just that right blend of bite and flavor. It was incredible. <coughs> I'm getting really, really hungry right now. <laughs> And so I, I, I said, man, would you make me just a little plate? I'm going to eat this. this was, and, and so I went and I sat down, and I was kind of by myself. And um, um, Mrs. Wildy came in. Mrs. Wildy lives right here behind the fence with, with her son and daughter-in-law. She moved here after her husband passed away a couple of years ago. After she had been at New Hope for about six or seven months, she started volunteering to help out as a server at our memorial services. Mrs. Weldy, though, has taken that open door to another step. I've watched her. Others have watched her. She, she doesn't just slop food on a plate. And, and uh, uh, none, nobody slops food on the plate here. They're very kind with it. But, but she's not just putting food on plates. When sh she's engaging people in conversation. When she's finished serving, she goes out and with pitcher in hand and she goes to their tables and she, can I get you more? Can I, can I, can I throw that away for you? She, she sits down with the family at, the, at, at a family table and she talks to them. She takes a second open door and she goes a little further. And then yesterday she stopped and she said, Tim, do you remember? And she gave me a name and she said, do you remember that? I said, yes, I remember it was about six months ago. She said, yeah. She said it was a, a wife who lost her husband she said, that day we had a little quiet time, just the two of us, and I told her I know exactly what she's going through. I kind of expressed to her how God had helped me get through the process and that I'm willing to help her if she ever needs it. And I gave her my phone number. She said she called me the next week. We've been engaged in weekly conversations for the last six months, and she's now starting to say, you know, I think I'm going to come check out what you've got. See, uh, one open door to serve led to an, oh, another open door to engage, led to another open door to take a next step. 
It may sound so simple, but you know what? Each one of those steps requires a bit of courage. It's stepping out of our comfort zone. Those are open-door people who realize their life had been blessed and God can use me to bless somebody else. Number four, open-door people resist and persist. Open-door people resist discouragement in the face of obstacles, and they persist in faithfulness despite long periods of waiting. There's a key line, and I'll come back after I read the Scriptures, but here's the key line I want to get out is this. If you're not dead, you're not done. If you're not dead, you're not done. Open-door people have fewer regrets. Number five, open-door people have fewer regrets. We often begin our lives the first 25 or 30 years regretting the wrong things we've done. Anybody here in your late teens and early 20s wish there were some things you hadn't have done? Yeah, yeah, amen, yeah, yeah, or oh me. <laughs> but we end our lives often regretting the open doors we never went through. I've sat by a lot of bedsides by folks saying, Tim, I wished I would have. I wished I had told my kids far more how important Jesus was to me. I wished I'd told my mom and dad when I came to faith how important Jesus is. I don't know where they're going. I wished I would have gone on that mission trip. I wished I would have told my friends. Lots of regrets. Number six, open door people learn about themselves. You see, if I'm to go through open doors, I will have to be humble enough to accept failure and flaws. Because many times we refuse to go through an open door because we think we're not good enough, worthy enough, smart enough to take the next step. And last of all, number seven, open door people are not paralyzed by their imperfections. We have this tendency to view people who walk through God's open doors as some sort of spiritual giants possessing a faith that's not possible to the rest of us. But the scripture reveals exactly the opposite. And that brings us back to number four. Open door people resist and persist. In Hebrews chapter 11, let's, uh, let's jump in at verse 27. We're going to do a little history lesson here in the time that we have this morning. Um, um, so I want to jump in at verse 27. If you know this story well, be patient with others because I'm going to take time. I'm discovering that mm, there are a lot of folks who don't know. I'm in Genesis. Did I say Hebrews just now? Genesis 11. I'm sorry. We're going to jump in at Genesis 11. Uh, beginning at verse 27. It's a good wife. Thank you, babe. Okay, here we go. This is the account of Terah. Y'all know who Terah is? He's the father of Abraham, okay? So a lot of folks, you know, Terah, no, I don't know who that is, all right? In, in Bible, he's the father of Abraham. Terah became the father of Abram, Nahor, and Haran. And Haran became the father of Lot, and Lot's important because down the road there's another story about Lot in the Old Testament. While his father Terah was still alive, Haran died in Ur of the Chaldeans in the land of his birth, and Abram and Nahor both married. And the name of Abram's wife was Sarah, and the name of Nahor's wife was Milcah, and she was the daughter of Haran. Don't get lost in some of this, all right? We'll, we'll, we're not going to get lost in the minutiae of family relationships. Verse 30, this is important. Now Sarah was barren. She had no children. Terah took his sons Abram and his grandson Lot, the son of Haran, and his daughter-in-law Sarah, and the wife of his son Abram, and together they set out from Ur of the Chaldeans to go to Canaan. Canaan was the promised land God said, I'll give to you as inheritance. Remember something important here. At this moment in time, there are no such things called Israelites or Jews. There's no chosen people of God walking the face of the earth. Okay? Didn't exist. Terah lived 205 years and he died in Haran. Um, Ur of the Chaldeans is kind of like a major metropolitan area. In his time, it'd be kind of like living in San Francisco. And Haran would be kind of like moving from San Francisco to New, to New York City. Okay? Very similar. They were the hub of culture and education in their day. And so, they're supposed to go to Canaan. Terah leaves Ur, finds a place just like he left, and says, I think I'll stop here. We'll come back to that a little later. Okay, so we've got the first part of the story going here. Um, 
<clears throat> Abraham and Sarah, uh, at this stage in life, they're 75 and 65. And they've not had children. That's a, a shame for them. In that culture, it was a disgrace. In, in that culture, it was also a reason for a lack of security. You see, there were no such things as social security and 401ks and retirement plans. When you got old, your children took care of you. That was it. And Abraham and Sarah had no one. 75, 65. And, and God comes to Abraham and says, Abraham, though you're 75, you are going to become the father of a great nation. What would you do if God came to you at 75? Anybody 75 in here or older? You're here 75? You want to, okay. How would you feel if God came to you and said, I'm going to make you the father of a great nation right now? You would do what Abraham did, and that is you'd probably laugh. Yeah, right. That's really going to happen. And, and that's what he tells him. And she's 65. And um, in fact, God tells Abram and Sarah that your descendants are going to become as the sands of the sea and the stars in the sky. You are going to have a huge family, and they're old. In fact, in the book of Hebrews chapter 11, it says it like this, you're as good as dead. That's what I said about him. He said, hey, you're still living, but you know, in terms of this family thing, you're as good as dead. But don't let your circumstances dictate your faith. That's one of the key things that we learn from Abram. And, 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 and so then God tells Abraham something else. He says, you know, but in order for this to happen, you need to go to Canaan. Often in terms for the promises to become reality in our lives, we have to obedient to go where we don't know where he's leading. Would you go through an open door and not know where it leads? We should. We don't like to, but we should. Between Genesis 11 and Hebrews 11, it tells us that Abraham and Sarah went to a country. They didn't know where they were going. God simply said, go, and I'll tell you when you get there. By faith, Hebrews 11 Abraham, when called to go to a place, would later receive his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he didn't know where he was going. And then Abram said, I'm too old. There's always an excuse for not to go through an open door. Bad timing. Not for me. I'm too old. There'll always be an excuse to hinder us. But open door people will resist those excuses and they will persist to enter by faith. It was Craig Grishel, a pastor in Oklahoma of a large number of churches, who coined the phrase from this story, if you're not dead, you're not done. If you all are still sitting up taking nourishment here at New Hope Church, you're not done. And do you know how long Abraham and Sarah had to wait in order to have that child that God promised them? 24 more years, and God comes back to Abraham and says, you know that promise? I'm now going to fulfill it. And, and Abraham laughs. He said, I'm 99 now. I'm going to have a baby when I'm 100. Mm, yeah, that's right, because that's my plan in fulfilling my promise. Age, young or old, should not be an excuse from being open-door people. Abraham tried to say he was too old. Timothy in the New Testament tried to say he was too young. Esther tried to say that she was the wrong gender. Moses tried to say no because he had the wrong gifts. Gideon tried to say no because his family was too poor. Elijah said no because he had the wrong enemies. Jonah said no because he didn't want to go to the right city. And Paul tried to say no because he had the wrong background. God kept saying, go, go, you go. And he wasn't talking about a car. He's talking about you, go. Sometimes it takes a while for God's promises to be fulfilled, but if we're not dead, then the job's not done. Open door people also have fewer regrets. Some of the saddest stories are about calls that never get an answered, the risks that are never taken, obedience that never gets obeyed, joyful generosity that never gets given, adventures that never happen, and lives that never get lived. I, I hope that won't be you or me. We often begin our lives regretting the wrong things that we did, but we end our life with regrets of the things we didn't do. What do we need to do now so that we're not living in regret then? 
We need to respond to the divine goes of open doors that we get every day in life. But we must be willing to leave before we can go. We've got to be willing to step out of our security blanket zones and say, God, this may be risky, but you're the one who takes on the risk. I'm going because you sent me. The outcome is not up to me, so I will trust you. And here's a problem for us in 21st century culture. We want to see the results of walking through open doors right now. How long did Abram have to wait to see the promise fulfilled? 24 years. You and I get tired of waiting. Abraham and Sarah got tired of waiting. Some of you remember that part of the story. I think it was 15 years had passed and the promise hadn't been fulfilled yet. And so Sarah gets an idea. And, and, and you and I do this frequently with God. Ooh, God needs a little help getting out of this jam he's in. And so Sarah said, you know, the culture in Ur, where we came from, they had a process where a couple who was barren could have a child and continue the family name. We think that surrogate mothers is something new in our culture. It's gone on for centuries. See, the culture that Abraham and Sarah came from was if, if, a, if a wife couldn't get pregnant, then she could take her handmaiden, her young servant, and she could offer her to her husband for a night so that she could then be a surrogate mother. And when that baby was born, the handmaiden would give it to the, the wife and they would raise that child as their own. That was culturally accepted. But remember, God said, I will give to you and Sarah a son. Sarah had waited long enough and she thought, okay, God told us the plan, but we need to help him fulfill it. So can you imagine... 75-year-old or 80-year-old woman coming to her husband and saying, I got a 22-year-old handmaiden, and I'll let you sleep with her for the night, and she'll have a baby for us. What do you think, honey? <laughs> I so wished it was written in the Scripture that Abraham would have said, Dear, I think we need to pray about this first. <laughs> but he didn't. Do you know what he said? Whatever you want, dear. And he forced himself to do it. <laughs> and they had a baby. And do you know his name? Ishmael. Go back and read this if you're not familiar with the story. It's all in the book of Genesis, and you'll find it also, portions of it in the book of Hebrews. And when Ishmael was born, God said, that is not my son of promise. That child that you had is what you did on your own that's not my answer to my promise. And just so you know, what you did out of the flesh is always going to have problems with the son I will give you, which is the son of promise. Ishmael and Isaac, brothers, yet enemies. And in case you don't know the rest of the story, all the problems in the Middle East today centuries later are because of a man and a woman trying to do for God what only God is supposed to do. Because all the descendants that are battling the, the Jewish nation of Israel are all descendants of Ishmael. And God told Abraham, that is not my son of promise, and here's a promise I will make you. Because you chose a fleshly way to deal with a spiritual matter, those descendants will be at war with each other for the rest of their days. Until Jesus comes again, there will never be long-term peace. I don't care who our president is. Nobody will bring long-term peace to that part of the world because that is still the testimony that we should never take matters into our own hands. Open door people have fewer regrets and open door people learn about themselves. Abraham and Sarah learned something about themselves in the process, but guess what? Just because they made some mistakes did not cut them off from the promise of God. 
That's a hope I want you to walk out here with today. A lot of times we will not walk through the smallest of open doors because we don't think we're worthy to walk through them. Trust me, this was not the only mistake that Abraham and Sarah made after they left Ur on their way to the land of Canaan. Did you know that Abraham lied twice to two leaders of countries about his wife Sarah? He told them, she's my sister. Because he thought she was so beautiful they might be interested in her and he didn't want them to think they needed to kill him in order to have her. What a jerk. <laughs> and one of the, the, the Pharaoh of Egypt said he knew something was amiss. And so he said, Abraham, hey, you tell me the whole story about Sarah. I've heard rumors she's your wife. Well, yeah, she is. And then he said, why would you anger your God by telling a lie to me? See, I mean, he didn't do it once. He did it twice. How many times have we lied to God and haven't learned our lesson? But what you, see, if I had written this story, I would have left out the lies. I wouldn't have told that in the story. I would have left out the Ishmael part. But God didn't, and he didn't for a reason. He wants you and I to learn. It's not about our perfection. It is about our trust in him. And Abraham, in spite of his stumblings, continued to go where God sent him. He continued to go through the open door God provided. Well, uh, the salami needs to be cut off. And so I'm going to stop right there, and we are going to pick up with the last two uh, next Sunday. Here's the thing I want to leave you with. Remember Tara? Who was Tara? Father of Abraham. All right, I need to put this part of my Bible back in its place. Um, <coughs> here's the deal about Tara. He was, in on, he was in on the open door to go to Canaan. If you read the chapter 11, it says they were on their way to Canaan when they left Ur. But Terah decided he liked Ur, and Haran was just like Ur, so I think I'll stop right here. And he died in Haran. He never got to see or experience the promise of God fulfilled in his life. If you had to look at your life at this very moment right now, would you say you're an Abraham on a journey to a place you're not sure where it's going to be, but you're going? Or are you a Terah? Are you stuck in Haran? Are you in a place because it's comfortable and familiar, and it's the way you like things. So I'm not going to upset my own life or anything else. I'm just going to stay put. Tara? Abraham. In spite of Abraham's blemishes, I'm pretty sure who I want to be like. I want to walk through the open doors, the small ones, middle-sized ones and the big ones because it ends in promise fulfilled. Open door people. Let's pray. Father, man, thank you for the worship today. It was so good. Nourished my soul for today. Thank you for your, your word. In spite of you, show your people with their warts and their blemishes and their failures. You never discard them. You continue to encourage them to go through open doors. May we here at New Hope, may we individually as well as collectively be people of promise who don't see the adversities and the obstacles as a reason to say no to open doors. But Father, we'll go through them so that we who have been blessed can continue to be blessings to others. Reveal to us Give us clearly whether we're a Terah or an Abraham. And let us know we don't have to stay stuck in Haran. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Guys, have a great day.